Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. My name is Craig McKenzie, and I am definitely not the fastest man alive. When I was a child, I became a nerd. Now I'm an adult, and I'm still a nerd. A desire to tell others made me start a podcast, and openly, I use it to talk about geeky stuff for others like me to hear it. This is Neil Before Pod. So joining me in this discussion in TV land is Chris. We couldn't find a third person. So hi, Chris. Oh, you're stuck with just me tonight. (laughs) Just you. The Uh, whole world pities you. Chris Evans and Chris Hemsworth weren't around, so yeah. Yeah, well, you know, we we tried. Chris Moyles was also not free tonight. Uh, A factor I'm eternally grateful for. (laughs) I don't want Chris Moyles on my show. You're you're, you're landed with Chris McCrell instead. Oh, well, there are worse things. (laughs) <laughs> right so tv we all watch television we all watch different shows and we watch dc shows don't we and we do I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, the dc I, I i prefer strangely the tv shows over the the movie universe at the moment yeah there's a there's a lot of that kind of chat going around people seem to prefer what they're doing on tv to the films and i can't say i disagree with them no, I think the the characters are are better developed, but maybe that's just because we've had more sort of screen time to share with the TV characters, which we don't really get with the movie ones. Because as soon as we get used to one, it changes. Yeah, um, it could simply be a, a timing thing, although it could be a tonal thing as well. Maybe the the TV tone is a bit easier to get around. A little bit lighter, isn't it? I, I always find that about the 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 DC TV stuff is a, a lot lighter than the movies are. I mean, there, there are some very dark episodes in there, but they always manage to fit a couple of jokes in or a couple of things that make you smile. Yeah, especially on Flash. Yes. Uh, so we should start with that, I guess. We're about to go into season three uh, next week in the US. I don't know when it's happening in the UK. Uh, and things have happened. Um, I'll ring the spoiler alert here. Never forget. The fastest man alive. Okay, so season two, we were just talking about it being lighter, but season two is quite a dark season overall, I thought, especially towards the end. It was for for Flash, which has been a very sort of light, jokey, you know, sort of pun filled, uh, you know, very fun naming of the naming of the villains kind of thing. It, It was a lot darker, a lot more sinister in the stakes. Uh, were a lot higher as well. Yeah. I think overall season two's quality was less than season one. But I would also say the storytelling is a lot more ambitious. They were braver with with the storylines. And I don't know whether it was, you know, the the sort of the, the joy of the first series was sort of getting to know everyone, getting to know these characters, where when the second one you're sort of, you're thrown right into it. You know the 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 baddie is there right away. You're you're sort of working towards that. Yeah, um, the whole idea of the multiverse was quite an interesting one as well, because obviously DC Comics they they love their reality jumping stories, and to bring that to TV in a way that was digestible, I suppose, uh, was was quite a brave thing to do. It was quite ambitious, and um, I think they did it in such a way that it was easy to understand. But there was plenty of drawn circles on on various whiteboards to explain it all. I think that I've now seen on about two or three TV shows that explain <laughs> the multiple realities. There is always someone sticking a pen for a piece of paper. <laughs> or uh, recently I was watching Stranger Things on Netflix, and in that it's a paper plate that has a uh, <laughs> that has something shoved through the middle of it to prove, oh, this is this is how it works. And you go there, that's like, yeah, I've seen this a couple of times now. I'm beginning, I'm beginning to get to know how all this multiverse thing works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's um, easily explained by a simple analogy, classic Star Trek uh, terminology, you know, whittle it down to the simplest thing. I think it's it was a really neat way, and I, I suppose it's something that was a bit necessary for them to sort of explain 
uh, you know, this sort of separate universe that Supergirl's in to the one that Flash is in and Arrow and all those ones that they've sort of put to one side and then this little wall that's between the other one. Yeah. You know, it, it gives them a good narrative reason for the two to be separate and sort of stops all those debates of why did, you know, why did Supergirl not just? Yeah. Although it creates other questions like, where is Superman in this universe? Good question. Yeah. He well, could I... still be a teenager in Smallville or, you know, his he missed his turn off before hitting Earth or something. He's not arrived yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's always Any that. minute now. Any minute now. <laughs> Big yeah. asteroid. Yeah. Just wait. Yeah, there's all I mean, there's all those sorts of questions, but I think the show keeps it quite light on them. It keeps it between Earth One and Earth Two, so you've got this kind of this uh connection between the two worlds and you have two characters, eventually three, that are from Earth Two, who kind of are ambassadors for it, I suppose. Yeah, I still I, I I did really like it. I liked the explanation and I liked the way that it all it all worked out in the end. I think they did a good job of what could have been a very overly confusing set of plots. Uh, they managed to keep it under control really well. Yeah. It actually reminded me of Fringe in some ways. Uh, when they had contact with the parallel universe, they um they essentially had a door to it in the basement, like they do in Flash, actually. So um, it was easy for the characters to move between them, and which they did quite frequently, or they would cut between the two. I think Flash did that less because it was still about Earth 1, it was more about Earth 2 appearing on Earth 1, so to speak, rather than regular crossovers. Yeah. No, I, I definitely think that, that is, that's the case. I think they, they worked on it really well. Yeah. Although I found the villain to be quite sinister at first. And then as it went on, he became more and more toothless to me. That I think that was kind of a problem with the the sort of Jay Garrick style character or, or Zoom. In a way, like you say, it's like once the sort of mystique and everything is gone, you're left with not as strong a villain as you started out with. And it does look a lot more defeatable mm. uh, in a way, even, even when you know, sort of Barry loses his powers and all that sort of stuff, you're still sitting there thinking, well, they're going to work this out, aren't they, by the <laughs> end of this? You know, I know I know, this isn't the way the series is going to end, but, yeah. you know, that, like you say, a lot of the teeth is gone. As soon as he stops sort of just getting rid of characters that are getting in his way, and, you know, you end up with the same as sort of the, the James Bond problem <laughs> uh, that sort of gets pointed out in Austin Powers, where you're going, just kill him, just kill him, shoot him right now, just get, <laughs> he's gone. He's you, you, you can get rid of him right now, right now. If you don't get rid of him, he's just gonna. Oh, he's escaped. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, it's uh, <laughs> you know, and it's. Uh, I think that was kind of the the problem. By the end of it, you're like, why did he not just, you know? And they sort of wrote themselves into a corner, and and then the villain sort of changes in order to sort of fit that. Why, why is he not taking over the world already? Okay, because we've, you know, we, we've built him up too big, so now we need to knock him down a couple of pegs, give him a lot of flaws now, so that it makes it yeah. a lot easier in the end. Yeah, the, there was also problems with, like, they, they introduced Jay Garrick early on, and it seemed like he was the Flash from Earth 2, and his greatest of evil was Zoom and all this stuff, and that was I was fine with that. It was when they tried to tie those two characters together, it didn't work for me. I feel like the reveal was a decision they made much later in the season. It could have been, yeah. It doesn't seem like it was planned from from minute one, as opposed to the Harrison Wells twist, which was clearly built up throughout the season and in the first season. Yeah, there were a lot of hints there to sort of get you get you working on it and investigate and query it. Yeah. Whereas with this one, it just sort of arrives out the blue. Yes, yeah. like you say, it doesn't seem like it was one hundred percent planned at the time. Yeah, and. It was just a mentor figure becomes his enemy thing again, so it felt a bit repetitive. By that same token, I think the Harrison Wells character, the Earth 2 Harrison Wells character, was really interesting this year. After seeing him being the villain at the end of uh, Series 1, going into Series 2, you're like, seeing this different, another version of that same character again, you know, I, I, I thought was done really, really well. In the end, uh, at first I thought, "Oh, I'm going to see more of this character again," but <laughs> it was it was different. It was a different version of that. 
Yeah, it's yeah. a real testament to Tom Cavanaugh's acting when he is able to play two different versions of the same guy, essentially, and not have them be compared to one another. Yeah, for, the, for there to be a, a, a difference in style and motivation and all that, while still keeping that sort of core bit of the character in there, I thought was was really, really good. Yeah, in a lot of ways, Wells too was, or Harry, as I called him in my reviews, <laughs> uh, he was... Um, he was completely the opposite to, well, Eobard Thon Wells, because he, you know, he was quite impatient. Uh, he wasn't nurturing at all. He was uh, essentially just a dick, as Cisco called him. Mm-hmm. Which I liked, and it was different. It allowed Tom Cavanaugh to do different things. And then when he had to pretend to be Earth Two Wells, pretending to be Earth One Wells, that was really eerie as well. It was, like you say, I just, I just think Tom Cavanaugh did a really good job of it. It, it was something that, if if it hadn't been done well, could have made the whole, the whole sort of plot and the whole story sort of fall apart, really. And I, I, I think all credits him for for managing to pull it off. Yeah, and I wonder if it's the intention was to only have uh, Eobard Thorne well around for one season. And then you know they didn't really plan to keep him around after that. But once they saw what the actor was capable of, they thought we need to keep this guy around. I think it definitely could have been the case because he was one of the best bits of the of the first series. He's definitely been one of my favourite bits of the second. Yeah, and uh, I wonder who he'll be in the third. <laughs> another Wells. <laughs> and, and another other other Wells. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of Inception. Yeah, a Wells within a Wells within. <laughs> no, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and his uh, daughter's quite an interesting character as well. What little we see of her. Yeah, I mean, obviously, initially, she's just the sort of captured, uh, you know, the the captured girl that needs saving, but that sort of develops a storyline of her own and her own motivations, you know, wanting to get home to her timeline. And it's, I, I think it was, it was good. You know, I, I, I didn't mind that character at all. At first, I thought, oh, there's going to be a really whingy character here <laughs> for the next, we're going to get the agonized teen for the rest of this series. And it's going to be really, really annoying. But <laughs> no, it, it actually turned out a lot better than that. Yeah, and um, the way they bounced off each other was quite good because she was quite uh, peppy and optimistic and he's just this eternal pessimist who sucks the life out of every situation. You know, any fun that try- Cisco tries to have, uh, he's he reminds him that Zoom's still out there and and he's like he's laser-focused on the task at hand at all times. That's, that's very true. I mean, I did... Cisco was a really fun character in the first series and in this one... I think that sort of light relief was gone because of the character was in his own sort of turmoil. Yeah. You know, you didn't get that same fun element, which I think is probably one of the bits that I kind of missed from the first series in this one, was that sort of light relief in between battles and fights and all that. That, that just seemed to be gone this, this series. Yeah, there was bits of it, but a lot of it was developing his vibe powers, uh, which worked well, I think. I think... Um, they were smart to keep them building gradually rather than have them just be, you know, him go from untrained to fully trained in the space of like two episodes because he's still not got a real handle on them and he's still struggling with them. And, and uh, obviously they manifest at plot convenient moments, but there's no getting around that, I suppose. But still. They do give you a little insight into what he could be capable of when, when yeah. you see him in Earth 2. You sort of get that hint of what, what he could actually achieve in the future. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see how he develops across season three, uh, assuming reality stays the way it is, because obviously Barry travels back in time to save his mother again at the end of season two, and he actually does it this time. Yes, now this is something that I've debated with you off the podcast, which is my slight hate for time travel. <laughs> and <laughs> the sort of way that, it's over the last a few different series that I've watched have had a time travel element where they suddenly go in and they rewrite a whole portion of what you've watched. Mm. And a lot of the time, I sort of look at it and go, "But you've just made all the time I've invested in getting to know these characters and enjoying the way they've developed, and you've just completely knocked it out." Yeah, that's ultimately where Fringe. I refer to this again, Jump the Shark for me because they got to a point where 
they had completely overwritten the characters with slightly different versions of themselves. But then by the time you get to whatever season it was, it just feels like this isn't the same show you've been watching because there's only one character that remains the same. Um, with the whole Flashpoint thing, based on the, the comic book and the animated film, I don't think they'll go down that route. I think he'll exist in this new world for a little while. Uh, he'll think it's great. Then he'll notice something is really, really wrong with it, and then he has to decide to fix it and put it back to the way it was. And that's where a lot of the drama will come from in the early parts of the season, I think. Well, see, you've got the advantage over me of having read the Flash comics. I've got to admit, I've, I've never read any of them, so I don't, I don't know the storylines as well as I know some other stuff. Mm. But I, I, I do worry always when they sort of introduce these points where they go back and they rewrite. Because you know that the first sort of few episodes are all going to be, oh, well, what are they doing now? Oh, they're completely different. They're off doing this. Okay, great. And, uh, oh, they're not boyfriend and girlfriend anymore. In fact, they don't know each other exists. Okay, great. You know, and it's, it's going to be that dynamic for the rest of the, you know, for the first sort of six episodes or so. You're going to be trawling through all that only for, like you say, for them to potentially go and go, we're just going to rewrite it again. And then it goes, you know, <laughs> uh, but we'll keep one quirk somewhere. Uh, <laughs> it sort, of, sort of permeates through the whole thing. You know, there'll be one quirk left over at the end. Yeah. Um, you know, where, where it is convenient for the writing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's just I've I've got this thing now where sort of I think time travel fatigue, where sort of the, it's used as a plot device sometimes too much, hmm. and it destroys a lot of stuff. And I, I I sometimes feel it's sort of writing that it comes down to. It's like oh, we hate these these decisions that we made over here, and we hate the way we made this character like this. Tell you what, we'll do we'll do some sort of very uh, plot jumpy time travel. And all that will be rewritten. We'll sort all these characters out that we made a bit of a mess of. Yeah. Well, the comics and the animated film, which uh, instead of reading the comic, you should watch the animated film. It's quite well done. It's a good digest of the actual story. Uh, and the TV show is almost certainly going to be nothing like it. But basically, by saving his mother, uh, he creates this this world that is so horrific. It kind of teaches him a lesson about not messing with the timeline. <laughs> Yeah, which he probably should have learned long before that because the Flash comics have been going for like 50 years or something and he's time travelled a lot. Um, well, that's one for me to check out later. Yeah, it's it's a good one. Um, it's well animated and the story's quite well told. But in that, um, to sum it up, basically, uh, once he saves his mother, there's a, they call it a time boom rather than a sonic boom, which is, you know, I don't know if such a thing is physically possible, but it's time travel, so who cares? Uh, and certain things are changed like it's Bruce Wayne that's killed in the alleyway so his father becomes uh, Batman uh, Superman's locked up in a government facility because his escape pod lands in Metropolis and destroys it um, Wonder Woman and Aquaman are at war with each other and they risk dooming the world, stuff like that uh, this won't happen in the TV show because it would be obscenely expensive um, but I think along the lines of the, the broad strokes of him noticing a, a world that's not quite right or has something horribly wrong with it will be there and he'll have to go and fix it. I think that that, that sounds like a future, though I do really, really want to see that alternate reality now. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a few years and uh, the DC films will probably do it and it'll be an hour and a half of things blowing up. It'll all be like Bruce Wayne's dreams. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be real. <laughs> or worse. Or worse, yeah. Could be. <laughs> but um, yeah, it is a good animated film, and clearly they're drawing inspiration from that storyline, especially since Jeff Johns, um, who's a big Flash writer, is involved, or used to be involved with the TV show. Now he's working on the films, I think. Uh, but they've clearly drawn inspiration from this, and they've been building up to it for a while because the... The whole moment of him saving his mother from being killed, that's kind of underpinned the series since the first minute of it, pretty much. Yeah, it has been what he's been trying to sort of fight against. He's sort of trying to prove the killer, you know, prove that his dad wasn't the killer from, you know, like you say, episode one yeah. onwards, you know. And I, 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 I have high hopes for it because I do enjoy the show. So I'll reserve judgment until I actually see it. <laughs> yeah. He says after passing judgment on it before he's it. <laughs> anyone who wants to see um, War Wo Wonder Woman at war with Aquaman probably isn't going to be getting it here. So manage expectations. Darn. 
but what I think they'll do is they'll make the mother, uh, Nora, the central focus of this whole argument uh, over whether he should change the past back or not. Um, and they're going to have to do some work to make us really like her, you know, make her sacrifice feel meaningful, because up until now she's been an idea. She's been this thing that Barry remembers and um, and wants to know rather than, you know, the, rather than lose her. Um, so we have to feel like she's kind of worth uh, caring about once she is sacrificed again. And that'll be a slight challenge, I think. Yeah, because it'll be this character that you've, like you say, a brand new introduction. No one really knows. Yeah. So, and, and neither does Barry at the end of it when you think about it. Yeah. So it's um, yeah, it's going to be very interesting. Like you say, the character's got to feel worth it because then you're like, well, all this has been changed for her. Yeah, and it's like um, it's like Uncle Ben and Spider Man or or Bruce Wayne's parents. You never really get to see them for any length of time. I mean, Spider Man comics retroactively give Uncle Ben a bit of a backstory, but you know, if you and the films give him a bit more to do because they're paying an actor, so they might as well give him some lines, but. More or less, he's this kind of collection of ideals that, that the character needs to live up to. And that's what Nora represents to Barry as well. So Definitely. she's going to have to be a little bit more than that if she's going to be a, a focal character in the show. But should be interesting. I'll be interested to see how they pull it off and obviously what changes it will it will leave once it's all undone. I say, hopefully, hopefully it's not. Uh, it doesn't just create a lot of characters that I really don't like for the <laughs> yeah. for the remainder of the remainder of the series. But uh, I, I'll reserve judgment until I see what they've done. And anything that affects Flash should surely affect Arrow. So I think their scope for changing the world from under them is slightly limited. Yeah, I mean, it's it'll be interesting to see because hopefully they will touch on what's happened over uh, with Arrow. Uh, after I'm changing the timeline, because you can imagine there probably will be some sort of ripple over that side. But um, but yeah, I think, like you say, it will limit their scope somewhat. Yeah, unless Flashpoint exists in a little pocket universe where Arrow's not affected. For writing reasons. <laughs> <laughs> because reasons. Yeah, and then uh, Rip Hunter and the... And his crew and the Wave Rider will point out that they're looking at two timelines and they don't know why. Who knows? It'll all tie in. It'll all tie in. <laughs> It'll all link in. <laughs> yeah. But season two, didn't enjoy it as much as season one overall, even though I thought it was more ambitious. I think it, it lagged a bit too much, especially in the middle. It, it did see a bit bulbous at points where yeah. you're going, there's some episodes of filler in here that have been put in, obviously, just to sort of take up a bit of room before they, they want to do plot reveals and, you know, and, and they want a big mid-season finish. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, they've got that, there is that little bit of filler to try and pack it out a bit. And I do wonder sometimes if being given a certain number of episodes sort of limits the writers a bit with like, well, actually, we want to tell a slightly shorter story, a bigger story, but shorter. You know, we don't want to sort of fill it full of extra stuff that we don't really need. Um, yeah. And then they end up having to sort of create it too big. But likewise, you don't want to see them limited to such a small scale that they can't really pull off anything. Yeah, maybe 23 is too many. Maybe, I don't know, 20, 18 or something might be a bit more tight in terms of storytelling. It could work. It could work. And then, you you know, obviously they've always got an episode, a lot of them now, where they're sort of tying into Arrow or Supergirl or into something else. So they've always got one episode that's kind of disjointed from the others anyway because they're trying to tell sort of two stories at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, but there were some things about it that I thought topped season one because uh, season one had the big special effects showcase with Grodd and his appearance was somewhat limited because the CGI must cost a fortune. But then they did a follow-up where they you saw him a lot more and it was still impressive. And, of course, King Shark appeared twice and had quite a significant role in one of the episodes and the visual effects work they can get away with on a TV budget just never stops impressing me on that show No, I do think the the special effects on it are fantastic um, and like you say on a TV budget, really surprising actually, some of what they can pull off now Yeah 
Uh, but it's got to be an expensive show because there's always stuff going on. I mean, they cut corners by reusing his running effects and all that stuff, but they always do that. So, um, But when every episode seems to have a big money shot at some point. I think it's sort of specifically planned to be that way, but they always want to have, a, a, like you say, the big money shot, the thing that can go in the little trailer yeah. for the show the next week, you know, that they can sort of trail in advance and, and, and keep people watching. And... I, I don't think they're frivolous with it. I think they they use it sparingly, and uh, it's it's not too bad. You know, it's because of the sort of meta human thing. It, it, it means they don't need to do as many sort of special effects as perhaps they would have needed to if it was all sort of alien characters or all characters look different. Mm. You know, they can focus more on what their powers do, and a lot of it is basically throwing things around and all that, which is a lot easier. Yeah, I suppose than some other special effects. Yeah, and I think one thing that made all the shows suffer, well, all two of them, because there was only two, um, is the episodes that they devoted to setting up the spin-off. You know, the, you had the, the Captain Cold episode and, and the Hawk people they took over, the crossover, and uh, the Firestorm one just felt like set up for, you know, this character to appear in Legends of Tomorrow, which it's fine in itself but it kind of feels like the, sh- the show you're watching is taking a back seat for this other show that isn't even on yet I do I do like it feeling like it is part of a bigger universe and it is all tied in but at the same time like you say th- some of those episodes do sort of feel like hang on hang on you're getting away from the we're in the middle of another story here why are we going off on this tangent yeah well the Firestorm one especially I mean they, they were setting it up quite well with, with Stein suffering from separation anxiety because he's you know, Ronnie was dead, or in another universe somewhere. Who knows? He'll probably come back. Um, and then they had to find another pairing for him, and they narrowed it down to two guys. And then the episode did uh, wasted no time in telling you which one it was going to be by focusing on one over the other. Whereas the, it could have felt like a natural episode if it had been kind of both candidates are are equally viable until the last minute sort of thing. Yeah, it was kind of obvious that, like you say, which which one was going to get chosen. Uh, Spoil a little bit for me that because I, I watched Legends of Tomorrow first, <laughs> so I knew I knew already what was going to happen. Yeah, oh, he's uh, I, I, I shouldn't have watched out of order. I spoiled that one for myself. <laughs> I can only I can only blame myself for what I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, unless there's anything else on Flash, we can move on to one of the others. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Um, Arrow, I guess, logically, um, even though that came first. Uh, Season four, an improvement on three, I thought. Definitely, yeah. Uh, It had a little bit more of a focus, at least at first. They were going down the magic route, which I quite liked. It was kind of like this guy who uses a bow and arrow against someone who's proficient in magic. It's a bit ludicrous in itself, but it kind of worked in, in giving him a challenge that was different to anything he'd done before. Yeah, I think it was it was interesting. And they've always sort of played around with the, the mystical element or the, you know, I, it, though it was more full-on sort of magic this year, um, which was which was interesting to watch. I, I did I did enjoy this one better, like I said, than the, than the other ones. I, I do like seeing this character develop and change Mm. And I was interested in how long it would be before he came out of suburbia and uh, back into, you know, quote unquote, real world again. Uh, Turns out about 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. I was, like, <laughs> I, I was kind of expecting the fight to go on just that little bit longer <laughs> while he sits there going, oh, I really, I really should go. And then being, no, no, I actually do you know what I'll leave them to it. They seem to be doing all right just now. <laughs> but yeah, very, very quickly. It's like, oh, actually, I'm not going to be a cook anymore. I'm going to go off over here. You know, it's. Um, yeah, it's it's really good, and I think I, I've enjoyed watching Stephen Amell's sort of build that character, though sometimes can be a bit too. Um, I'm trying to think of the correct word to use, but some of the speeches and everything, you think would that character be sort of standing there making that speech? Uh, not particularly, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it does seem that occasionally, or something there, something there going, he is very inspirational at this moment, but I don't think he would be. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, watching it, it's it's a show that I really really liked seeing getting to know all these characters and seeing the way they're playing off each other now is brilliant. 
And I, I, I thought this year quite a good villain as well. Oh, Damien Dark was, was immense. Um, Neil McDonough, he was magnetic in his performance every time. He, he did seem, you know, there was, there was no point where he sort of seemed too comic or too breakable, though he did suffer from sort of a very similar thing to Zoom yeah. uh, that we were talking about earlier on, where it's sort of, he's so powerful. He is so connected and able to get things done and he's got a grand plan and he's following through with it and he's got all these ideas. And then suddenly you're like, oh, he's very defeatable again. What, what happened there? You know, it's like it, there's, a, there's a sort of switch where they go, right, okay, we're getting towards the end of the season. He's now a lot less powerful and uh, it's all falling to pieces. And, uh, you know, it, in the end, you know, that, 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 that kind of disappointed me a little bit. Um, but I did think it was a really good character. Yeah, there was a lot of inconsistencies, especially towards the end. There was when he got put in prison. Um, someone told him that his plan didn't need him, or the Hive's plan didn't need him. But then an episode later, they were ready for breaking him out because he was integral to whatever they were up to. So it kind of felt like the writers either weren't paying attention or thought that we wouldn't notice. I did think the reveal of the sort of underground city at the end was was really interesting because you're wondering always it's always in these shows where they're talking about the plan yeah <laughs> and it's always you know the undertaking the plan the thing that we're going to be doing later on and it's all talked about sitting you're going well what are they actually up to oh right they're building a city underground of course they are right okay <laughs> yeah. and it's uh, you know I I just uh, I, I thought it was a little bit fun I, I would have found it more interesting if they had kept that not mysterious for a little bit longer but let us see more of that what were they planning to do for a little bit longer before it all comes crashing down yeah and it was completely off the rails towards the end i mean team arrow should never be bringing down nukes that's just feels like it should be above them they're kind of supposed to be street level in a way so they can deal with a siege within their city uh, but they should shouldn't really be bringing down the world's nuclear arsenal. <laughs> that was ridiculous. I did think that was a bit a bit grand towards the end. You're going this this you know they would be gone by now. They, yeah. You know this this isn't something that is solved by a quick a quick hack. <laughs> Felicity you know, on a tablet and on on, on a tablet <laughs> and, and uh, you know remotely somewhere going okay now now we'll just bring down the nukes. That's fine. You know all yeah. all, all done. <laughs> you know we had yeah. the button we had we had the stop <laughs> nuke button. Uh, you know quickly did that code. You know, there's there's some hacking, and I, I do, <laughs> I do think hacking sometimes an arrow is sort of the catch-all thing. How how do we solve this? Oh, we'll we'll just hack that computer. Job done. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'll, how, I'll hack into this. Will you fire arrows at people? Yes. Yeah. You you, you fire arrows at the nukes while I hack the <laughs> <laughs> out the ground. Uh, you know, into the ground, and that'll be it. You know, it's, you need to knock a small hatch off the uh, off the nuke so I can hack it. You, you need to fire this USB stick directly <laughs> at the nuke. <laughs> it will upload a virus to all the other nukes, and then they'll fall out of the sky. Uh, <laughs> only you can do it. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is one of those bits where you go, oh, not again. Um, that's, that's the way they've done it. it. So I think that's what was interesting about bringing the magic element into it this year, because it is yeah. something that can't be hacked. It's not a piece of technology that's sort of sitting about that you can plug the laptop into and go, okay, there you go. Once, once they've got the database and the thing, that's it. They can, they can stop it all. Yeah. And Oliver had to learn how to be a more well-rounded person to counter Damien Dark's death magic, uh, which he managed to do in about half an hour. So, you know, quick study. I know. I, I think I might do that course myself. <laughs> yeah. He goes yeah, and talks think, to someone. Then she yeah. tells him, "Oh, you're too, uh, you're you're too impure, or whatever it is." And then he fights Dark a few minutes later, and he's able to stop him from killing him. Well, that's magic for you, isn't yeah, it? That's that's Oliver Queen for you, apparently. I'm, I'm going to do one of those uh, five minutes to mindfulness apps, <laughs> and I think that'll uh, yeah. that'll sort me out for the end of this. Yeah, all the top gurus in the world try, you know, spend their entire lives and their vows of silence to try and reach some kind of enlightenment but Oliver Queen five minutes and being told he can't do it and now he can do it it would have been a really different series to watch 10 episodes of meditation <laughs> <laughs> where's Oliver meditating again <laughs> oh. on the salmon ladder for some reason air. no no he's through in that room next door with some candles lit he's thinking really hard hanging upside down from the ceiling or something like that 
<laughs> there was actually one part of the whole going back to the whole nuke plot. Um, there was one part of it that kind of made me gasp a little bit. It was when Felicity made the choice of uh, the nuke hitting the least populated area out of the two. I think it was going to hit one of two places, and she chose the one that had less of a population because that was the choice. Uh, and then afterwards, you would think it would be something that would weigh on her for the rest of the season at the very least. But it's kind of shrugged off, which is weird, because that's essentially the next Hiroshima. You know, the the world would change if if an entire town was obliterated by a, a nuke. I know, it is, like you say sometimes, I don't know whether it's the amount of time they've got or whether that's a whole plot that they haven't quite focused on or they originally planned to focus more on and then had to sort of write it out. You know, I, I don't imagine that they sort of just left it as a doing that and then having no no thoughts about it later. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see if they revisit it, if it's something where, you know, obviously in the heat of the moment and adrenaline and the, adrenaline and everything sort of gets her through it, where maybe in the next series you then she then turns around and goes, God, what, what did I do, you know? Why did I do this? Well, there was even, there was quiet moments in following episodes. There was one where Diggle was more worried about the fact that he'd killed his brother rather than the fact that hundreds of thousands of people had died or whatever it was and Felicity didn't even mention it which is, it just feels strange to have a big event like that and not have it mean anything and the, it's kind of a problem that Arrow has had since probably season 3 actually where all these big pivotal things keep happening and then they focus on the wrong thing uh, they're more focused on the sh- the annoying love triangles or Felicity being annoyed at Oliver for keeping his son a secret or any of other such nonsense. That was that was a bit where I, I I just didn't quite understand as well that sort of subplot of keeping keeping the son secret from Felicity where it seemed unnecessary to do so because how how would the mother find out that Felicity knew? Yeah, it was considering that Felicity drama. is pretty good at keeping secrets so far. Yeah. Uh, let's face it. So, so why why would it have been an issue? Or you know, I I see it as a, you know I'm keeping a promise that he made, mm. but I I don't understand why he wouldn't have broken that one, considering he has broken others in the past. Yeah, well, I guess it was this Oliver Queen's trying not to trying to do things differently, or in this season, in the um, and th- that was a theme running throughout, and he saw it as the only way. But I mean that. Is it Sam the woman's name was? Whatever her name was. She was being completely unreasonable for a start. Uh, And she should have seen that. Because she seemed otherwise reasonable. And when Felicity found out in the timeline that gets erased, she was also being unreasonable. Because uh, he'd just found out and she was badgering him about it. You know, rather than giving him just a minute to collect himself and then figure out how to deal with it. I mean, it all comes out in the wash anyway. I mean, if Thea can find out... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, sorry i interrupted you there no it's fine um so the the illegitimate son plot was was something i just couldn't be bothered with because it created all this pointless pointless lovey-dovey drama that they just don't seem to get make compelling in any way and it was just an excuse to split felicity and oliver up that didn't work i don't think like you say, it gives it gives them an excuse to boot someone to one side and take one of the team away. Yeah, uh, for a period while it's convenient. Yeah, and on the same token, there was Felicity's um, inability to walk for a while. Uh, that didn't really sit long enough. Pardon the pun to have any major consequences for her either. She had a couple of episodes where she was dealing with it, and then she was cured instantly. Yeah, the technology came along very, very quickly yeah. to 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 get rid of the wheelchair again. I do think it would have been more interesting, like you say, to for that to have played out a lot longer. Yeah, I mean, for the rest of the season, I think it would have been it would have been more interesting to to have her wheelchair bound for that. But I don't know. They they did it the way they did it, I suppose. But there are still hints that they're not quite sure what they're doing with certain characters, and uh, without pairing Felicity up with whatever superhero happens to turn up that week. That's all they can think of for her, apparently. It is quite a big team now. Because of the number of seasons that you've had, the the, the sort of team and the the characters around that have grown and grown and grown. 
So trying to give them all their piece of storyline that's theirs is, I imagine, for the writing is very difficult. Yeah, and for the most part, they they forget about people. Like Laurel, for instance, she constantly gets kind of forgotten about. Even though she died, and uh, they probably should have given her a bigger role before she died, otherwise it doesn't really feel like it, it matters in the grander scheme of things because it's not a character that was essential to the show. It does, it does seem a shame for that to happen, but it does show with this universe that there are consequences and that none of them are particularly safe. Yeah. Because I was worried that, you know, the Lazarus pit was going to be the thing for the rest of this now yeah. that, you know, you're not worried about any of the characters because, you know, in the end, we've sort of worked this out. Now we'll take them to the pit and uh, then they'll be back and then that'll be it. Yeah, but then Nyssa destroyed that, which is fine. So they need to find other ways to resurrect people. Yeah, it, I think that helps a bit because it, it makes sure that you know that there's consequences in this universe. Mm. And it helps the, I think it helps with the story as well because then you do feel worried for the characters when they're put in peril now. Yeah. Rather than sort of constantly thinking, oh, well, they'll just be back or they'll, they'll find a way. And, the, you know, they'll still potentially find a way to bring characters back. Yeah, like Diggle's brother, the character that nobody really yes. needed to come back. <laughs> And that wasn't handled terribly well either. He was back and then he was under Dark's control and then he wasn't and then it turns out he was all along. It was confusing. And it wasn't really necessary because I think it takes a bit away from Diggle's journey throughout the series as well. Ever since he's, you know, ever since the start, he's been the guy that lost his brother and it's really defined him as a person and then suddenly he's dealing with his brother being back. And it doesn't... Really yeah, work. it's sort of the, the the brother was back, and then there's all that time trying to save the brother in the first place. Yeah, to then have him back, and then they seem to sort of change their mind at some point. They went, "Oh, actually, we don't want this character around. This is going to be a lot of work. We'll just make him bad again, and then he'll be gone again." Yeah, and it so it takes away that character development that Diggle had, and pushes it back again. Yeah, um, when there were teasing his involvement earlier in the season, you know, when he was still, by all intents and purposes, dead. Uh, they had this whole thing about him being a drug dealer in Afghanistan and stuff like that, and that was the reason he was killed, because he was competition for Hive or something like that. And Diggle coming to terms with his brother not being the guy he remembers, that was interesting. But then having I think him, that did work, yeah. yeah. Having him be able to confront that is less interesting, I think, or confront him about it. I think if he'd had to deal with that, with that knowledge without anything to bounce off, I think that would be much more meaningful. Yeah, definitely, without being able to get the brother's side or to actually confront him about it, but just have to deal with knowing about it, I think would have been better for them. And of course, by the end of the season, he's off in the military again. So who knows what his role next season will be. I, I don't know, it might be like uh, uh, Oliver's Suburbia, where it lasts uh, <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 10 minutes, and then uh, probably a lot of flashbacks in future episodes. <laughs> and he'll discover something in the Middle East that, uh, that that becomes hugely important to the plot, and he'll bring it back. I, I imagine so. Or or he will go missing, MIA. Yeah. That's There's awesome. only one person that can find them. <laughs> I've always liked Diggle. I think he's, um, I think he's been a really important part of the show since day one. And if he's gone for an extended period of time, I think the the show will suffer. No, I think it's a character that they worked well on, definitely during the first few series to sort of build up from yeah. initially Oliver sort of trying to run running rings around him. Yeah. To um to him figuring everything out, and you're like, oh no, actually this guy is pretty smart. And then building up his role within the team from the guy that drives the van to sort of being a core member of the the team, I think, has been really good. With his Magneto helmet. <laughs> yeah, the, the the helmet does look a little bit silly. I've got, <laughs> wait, so that, without a sort of outfit to go with the helmet. Even even if it did, I think it would still look pretty, pretty stupid. It would look a little bit out of place, but, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe when he comes back, he'll have, the full, he'll have full body armor instead, yeah. you know, instead of just <laughs> armor over his head. <laughs> maybe. Anything's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think... Or, uh, Thea was one of the most interesting things about this season. But I find her an interesting character in general because she's always got all this stuff going on that 
that's kind of independent of everyone else. And I think if um, if the show ever could do without Oliver Queen, she could easily lead a show on her own. She's definitely got enough depth, and uh, the actress whose name I cannot remember off the top of my head, Willa Holland. That's it. That's one. <laughs> uh, I think has done a great job in playing her because this this character has had so many layers added on over time uh, through the plot and has been pretty key to a lot of the stories as well. Um, along with a sort of Malcolm Merlin sort of subplot that always sort of bubbles along in the background. Yeah, I think it's been has been really really well done. Yeah, um, remember her as, her, her as the annoying kid sister way back in season one and now she's... Well, I was talking about teenage angst earlier yeah. on and <laughs> it's one of those characters where at the beginning you're like, oh my god, it's the whingy characters back again and yeah. and there is something in that voice as well, which did grate on me slightly. <laughs> uh, which I've gotten used to. <laughs> but yeah, I do uh, I, 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 I do enjoy the character. I do think she's key. I don't know if sometimes she gets more screen time than some of the other characters where you're like actually it would be nice to get a bit more from someone else's perspective yeah um, I mean, but maybe it's because of that extra screen time that makes her sort of slightly better in her eyes yeah and she's a uh, she has a lot to deal with i think her um rage plot in the earliest earlier parts of the season were a bit was a bit underwhelming but the way that sort of the way it developed in some ways was quite interesting. You know, her relationship with Malcolm is is always a really tenuous one. They they flirt between hatred and and I guess acceptance. But the the way he was trying to get her to go out and kill horrible people to calm her own bloodlust because it was to his mind the only way to do it, and she refused. Um, that was interesting in itself. And but they could have done more with that. Where seeing her be tempted to do it. I mean, we saw her trying. to like seriously hurting people early on, but other than that, it was just her being angry, a bit like Roy was at first when he had his super strength. Yeah, it was just a lot of her being very, very moody and not wanting to to talk to anyone. But I do think that's how the the Merlin character would would have dealt with it. Yeah, you know, it was it was a very sort of just go after these people; these are bad people. Just go after them. You know, what what's wrong with that? And I, I think that was I think that was a great way of doing it. And I always find it pretty funny watching John Barrowman being so serious in Arrow. <laughs> you know, after seeing him on the TV over here, always being that, <laughs> yeah. you know, a very a very light character normally. And then watching him on this being very, very, very serious. And over here he's hosting game shows. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's always a bit weird. I, I don't know. Sometimes I think it takes me out of the show a little bit. We're going, <laughs> oh, it's John Barrowman. Here he is. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you know he's I, I think he's played that character really well I don't know if he's just been such a good sort of not a, a second rate villain I don't, I don't know what to call it, a sort of second tier villain where he's never the never particularly the main hmm. uh, villain in the piece, he's always sort of someone else's, else's uh, assistant through <laughs> the whole thing, but there is this, always this bit in the back of my head that's like he's, he's just going to change again yeah. And he's he's, he's going to betray you again any any minute now. I know it's coming. I don't know why he will betray you or what for, but at some point he's going to do something which is despicable and you're really going to disagree with him again. <laughs> and then build up over another few episodes and he will be back helping you again because he will have the what's it that is necessary. <laughs> he does seem to fulfill whatever function the plot needs him to, whether that be heroic or villainous. Uh which kind of, I suppose they don't know what to do with him ever since he was the, the villain in season one. But uh, I wonder how many of the characters seem to have forgotten the fact that he leveled a large part of the city. It does seem like something that's glossed over pretty often. Yeah. You know, he, he is a despicable character in so many ways and they keep getting back into bed with him and, and helping each other out. It's always a sort of, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, but then he sort of runs off and betrays everyone again <laughs> yeah, and then vanishes and then comes back a few episodes later, you know, sort of cap in hand going, please help me out again. You know? Yeah. It's, it, uh, hopefully, hopefully he's not featured as heavily in the next series. I think he needs to sort of disappear off somewhere so that we're not overexposed to him. Well, apparently he signed a contract that lets him appear on all of the shows. Well, there you go. He might, so, he might be in another sub-universe somewhere. <laughs> yeah, or he'll just yeah he'll turn up in in Flash when they need him to, in Legends when they need him to, and so on. I'm not sure, but um, he's a good character. I think 
all of the Arrow characters have a lot of potential. And like I said about Laurel earlier, if they were really going to kill her off, then they should have made this season be about why that's a big problem or why why it's such a shame. I mean, it was done quite well when the death actually happened, but having them tease it from the first episode with a flash forward showing Oliver and Barry standing at her grave and then you return to that flashback a couple of, or flash forward a couple of times throughout the season and then have it revealed that it's Laurel when she's kind of been in the background most of the time. Felt a bit like they hadn't taken advantage of the time they'd spent to build towards that point. Yeah, I agree with you there, actually. And it was like, when in the episode where she died, I worked it out in the first three or four minutes, because you had all this, suddenly Laurel was in every scene, and she was having meaningful conversations with people, and she was getting offered a job, you know, that, that would secure her future, and all this stuff. Uh, yeah, like, yeah this, this, this is the point where you know the characters are about to come into some very deep trouble. Yeah. Uh, when, when they start appearing and they get face time with each of the other characters, yeah. you're like, oh, okay, they're doing the victory tour and then they're going, you know. Yeah. So Every, she, everything's looking up for this character, you know, new job, everyone's, you know, they're going out with the person <laughs> that they want to be, you know, everything's really smiling and like, oh, and they're dead. Yeah. yeah. It's a shame it's here go, but then her meta human counterparts over on Flash locked in the prison, so, you know, she's she's probably not going anywhere, the actress anyway. I think they will bring her back at some point. And you need to find uh, out what she whispered to Oliver as well. Oh, I'm sure they could tease that out for a, a long period. I mean, my money's on that being underwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> it'll build, it'll build up a lot, and then it'll be a very little disappointing. It'll be something there. like, "I have milk in the fridge that's going out of date. Please drink it." <laughs> I think I might be celiac. You know, like... <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what they what they do next season. Apparently, they're going back to basics with. Uh, a vigilante bad guy and Oliver's the mayor and all this stuff. So maybe it'll go back to being the um, the Batman show without being a Batman show. I think it will be a, a different dynamic with him being the mayor. Once again, it might be one of these things that last 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, hopefully they keep it going just that little bit longer, you know, where he's he's sort of not quite able to, to fight the way he wants to. You know, with people knowing that he's the mayor and, mm. you know, with all those responsibilities. And we've got our f- the final season of flashbacks, at least. Because those have been dragging. The, the flashbacks have been getting longer and longer. When it, when it discovers that I spent all this time on this island, oh no, actually, I did a world tour <laughs> and revis- revisited my home a couple of times. For then five I years, I was island. sometimes on a hellish island. Yeah. <laughs> I spent, I spent uh, five, five years on this island and then not on it for a very long period. And then eventually, I, eventually he's going to come back and, and, and fire that flare. I don't yeah. know when. <laughs> <laughs> Last episode of season five, surely. <laughs> you hope so. You know, yeah. Finally, he's discovered. And I don't, I don't know whose subplot they'll then, uh, then tease into it. Yeah, and it's, and it's, it kind of worked in season one and two because uh, they spent all this time developing Deathstroke or Slade. Uh, and at the point in season two where they, re- where they revealed that he was the villain for the season, they then spent the flashbacks setting up how he became the villain of that season. No, so, I do think it was. I, I do think it worked really well in that case. But like you say, with this, that recently they've sort of dragged and been very long and not as interesting as the main plot. Where yeah. originally you were like, oh, actually, I, I do want to see what he did on this island and why he knows knows this and how he honed these skills. And then you're going, well, actually, we've kind of seen all that now. Yeah. So what what else is there that he did? And it. It it does seem very strange some of the places where he popped up, <laughs> uh, you know. And they cut them down to about forty seconds per episode, or, or forty seconds per cut. Uh, it, certainly towards the end, because they clearly did not have a season's worth of story. So I'm, yeah, it, I'm worried that season five will be more like that. Well, hopefully they they've sort of worked on it a little bit, and they know where they're wanting to go with it. Mm. You know, there was a lot of sort of exposition in them before that was useful for the main plot. Yeah. But, you know, a, a lot of the time now it's like, oh, well, I didn't tell you everything that happened. Yeah. And the formula uh, was quite interesting. Wait, surprise, surprise, surprise. You know, there's yet another thing that he's done while he's been away that somehow ties into this, yeah. this season. Yeah. Well, the formula was quite interesting, especially in season one where it was like, 
where a problem would crop up in the present day and then he would be like, oh, there was this time on the island that reminds me of this exact thing that we're dealing with right now. I mean, that's like dramatic convenience and it works because it ties the two stories together. And that, I didn't feel like that was quite there for season three or four. There was a little something missing towards the end there. And like, like you say, hopefully when they deploy it in this upcoming season, it's it's done more wisely and they have a better plot for it. Yeah. Because it seemed in the first couple of seasons like they had a, a writer properly working on that sub storyline mm. of its own you know and they and they spent time developing that where later on it seems like they forgot they had to do those bits yeah and then they sort of had to fill in the blanks later they wrote the main plot and then went right what do we need in this subplot to tie in now mm. yeah it's not as effective as it could be but still it's i guess it's a necessary part and we have to see it through at the end but maybe they could find a way to not have them in every episode so that when they are actually shown in an episode, they're relevant. That'd be one way to do it. It definitely could work. Or even if they just have one episode in the middle of the season hmm. where they look back and they and they follow it that way. Yeah. You know, it might it might be more interesting to do it as a whole you know, a whole episode of it, get it out of the way, <laughs> then carry on, you know. Yeah could go either way we'll see in about a week's time or we'll start to see in about a week's time first 10 minutes of him being mayor following (laughs) 10 minutes of diggle (laughs) diggle getting captured or going mia (laughs) 20 minutes on him getting his new costume (laughs) yeah well it's got got to be a full-blown costume you know i'm I'm, I'm more armor more than than just a helmet (laughs) well this one has sleeves which is (laughs) from what from the picture i've seen he's got his sleeves back Oh well, there you go. That's Despite sorry. bragging to Barry that last season that he doesn't get cold. Well, now, now he's got to sleep. Wimp. <laughs> that's that's what it is. That's what's happening. He's becoming a wimp every <laughs> as time goes by. <laughs> I'm not going to say that to his face because you know he's quite a big guy. But it's all yeah. right. I'll, I'll fight on your behalf. Honest. <laughs> I won't just run away. I don't think getting our asses kicked is a solution here. <laughs> just be practice. It's fine. <laughs> So, is there anything else on Arrow? I think we've covered the broad strokes. Oh, Constantine was in it. Uh, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, that, that, see, that's a show that I've, I've never particularly watched. So, uh, I, I, yeah, it's, it's one that I've always been meaning to watch at some point, and then I've never got around to it. Yeah. But I, I did enjoy the character when he appeared. Yeah, he, this, the show is good, um, and it's a shame it got cancelled. And the, every now and again, they dangle the, the carrot in front of fans' faces as if to say, "We'll give it, we'll get it back, we'll get it back. Don't worry, it's just a matter of time." But his one appearance in Arrow was apparently quite difficult to accomplish because he was doing a play in London or something, so they had to fly him out and film for a couple of days and get it all done and then fly him back. But the fact that they moved, made that effort to get the guy in there was was quite interesting. I mean, it could be something that does save the character for the fans. You know, if he if he is, does exist in this universe, then he might get in to a couple of the other shows and yeah. sort of pop up an arrow every once in a while. And if it keeps the character and people are still interested in the character, then it could come back. Yeah. Potentially. And in terms of the episode he was in, I think it suffered from the fact that they didn't have that much time with him. So he was only in a handful of scenes. Uh, and they did feel important, but it, it's almost as if the... The episode was originally written for some random character that knows about magic, and then they just threw Constantine in with his personality at the last minute. Uh, which, if that's if that's what happened in terms of how they got the negotiations done, then fine. I'm just glad that we got him instead of some no name character. You know, like like later in the season when he goes to see someone that's just not a that's just nobody, but Constantine recommended them. It's clear that. I searched, in the, I searched in the yellow pages for a person <laughs> that knows magic, and this yeah. name came up. Uh, so yeah. let's, go, let's go and get her. It's almost as if the reverse of that, though. You know, they kind of weren't expecting it to get Constantine, then they got him, and then they wrote a part for him, and then didn't get him <laughs> later on, you know. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, I, I, I did. I, the magic piece did seem to be convenience at some points. That was the only, the only thing about it. You know, in, in the end, it was easier defeated than it probably should have been Mm. yeah I mean it was all about I can't I actually can't remember how Oliver eventually defeated him but I think it was get the the totem I think at the end break the idol yeah break the idol yeah 
and I don't know if you've seen the animated Vixen cartoon thing. It doesn't run for long, but it's really, it's quite good. And the fact that they managed to get the, the same actress voicing her playing the character in the show was, was an impressive one. You know, her that could summon the spirits of animals and have them inhabit her, so she gets an elephant strength or whatever. No, I did, I did think that it did work a bit, but it's... I, I just... The the way it sort of worked out at the end, and then that character is, you know, where do they then go with that in the future? And and how does that impact? Because if all these people are around, yeah, and he's got all these people in his phone book <laughs> that he can just call at any minute and go, hi, hey, I've got a bit of a problem here, actually. Could you come in and help me out with this? Then, you, you know, it does make it more difficult in the future for them to write the villains. The villains have got to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. You know, like you say, at the end of this, a full-blown nuclear strike. <laughs> so how do you get bigger and bigger every series or every, think, every, every season? Or, or do they need to make it more personal and bring it in for the next one I think rather than it being in, this world-encompassing yeah. evil? Yeah, escalation's always a problem, I think. Um, you know, you get to a point where it, uh, Aaron, who you were on the last podcast with, he often talks about how um, it feels like an end of, end of video game boss you know, you you just you dance around this character for twenty odd episodes, and then you eventually fight them in a big climatic confrontation. And having it, and every season of Arrow has essentially been that. Uh, season two did it best, I think, but with Rachel Gould in season three, and then Damian Dark in season four, it was all about waiting till that final battle. And uh, I was quite impressed when Flash bucked that trend in season one by having it be a very intimate, personal story about him dealing with the the memory of his mother and deciding whether or not to save her you know that was that's not what you expect from an action adventure show doing us during a season finale but with arrow you just keep getting more of the same there's a good way of looking at it like the video <laughs> game sort of thing of building building up to the one big fight at the end yeah and then that's it roll credits you know move on yeah roll credits wait for the sequel i'm hoping that the vigilante bad guy next season will be uh, will be a, a nice change of pace and, and bring Arrow back to the more kind of grounded roots that, that made it so popular in the first place. I mean, it still does exist in a world with the Flash and with all this magic and stuff, but sometimes it just needs to be some guy versus another guy and they have some kind of ideological disagreement. That's all it needs to be sometimes. It will be interesting to see what way they go. Hopefully they do buck the trend and sort of change it up a little. Yeah, because surely these these are things that they will be noticing themselves as well, or they'll be noticing fan feedback if nothing else. But so overall, if- I, I, overall, I did I did like this season, and um, no, I, I think I think they've been going really really well considering how far in they are. Mm. This is the point where programs are normally starting to turn the other way. Yeah, and Arrow's working to get back there, so we'll see. So I think on that, um, we've we've talked enough about Arrow. Since the discussion lasted more than two hours, I thought it best to make it become something else and split the podcast into two parts. Thanks to YouTuber nstens1117 for all the music and join me and Chris in part two where we continue our conversation.